Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second installment of Golondrinas Live Sessions. My name is Laura Gonzalez. I'm the Education and Volunteer Manager here at El Rancho de las Golondrinas Living History Museum, located in the beautiful and historic La Cienega Valley, located just south of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Our very special guest today that's joining me is La Golondrinas weaver, tour guide, and interpreter Patricia Tucker to share with you a little bit about the history of some of our animal residents, the churro sheep, and a little bit about the very interesting and traditional process of weaving. She's going to talk to you a little bit about our Las Golondrinas Sheep to Blanket program. Now, if any of you have any questions at all during this segment, feel free to post them into the comments under the video, and we'll, get ans we'll answer them as we go along. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Patricia Tucker. Hello, Patricia. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Laura. Well, welcome to the ranch. It's a glorious afternoon out here. First, I want to say a special thanks to Dan Goodman for being the head of the ranch and getting us through these really challenging times. And Vic and Laura, who are putting together these wonderful segments. I'm going to be talking about the beginning of the textile process. Textiles being cloth, anything made out of cloth. There's a couple things I want you to know up front. One is many roads lead to Rome, meaning that there are more than one way to do everything and anything in weaving, in carding, in washing wool, in weaving. So if I say something or say, this is the way we do it, and you think my grandmother did it differently, you're right, there is more in one way. Piggybacking on that, no one culture created this process. Every culture individually figured out how to make yarn, the spinning, and to put it together, weaving. And it's not like they it all came from one place. Here in North America, they found looms in Mesa Verde that they were weaving blankets out of turkey feathers. Turkey feathers, they're supposed to be incredible. Um, when the Spanish got here, the indigenous people were had already for a long time been raising and weaving with cotton. So fabric was already here. What the Spanish brought were the churro sheep. Now we'll be talking about churro sheep, churro wool, and a little bit how we process that in the beginning of the process. Not all wool is treated the same. And what we do is the churro wool. Now, when the weavers came up from Mexico, they knew what they needed. They were experienced artisans. However, you can't bring everything up because of the journey. So they came up here, and the Spanish kind of looked around and said, you know, this isn't quite what we thought we were getting into. They relied very heavily on the indigenous people to help them figure out how to do the things they knew how to do with what was here. First, we're gonna talk about the churro sheep. We have a, our own little flock of churro sheep out here. They are admirably taken care of by Sean, our director of operations, and Cesar and David. And they started out over in Spain. There were two breeds of sheep in Spain at this time. And there were merino sheep and churra, what they called churra sheep. Merino being the royal breed and the churra sheep they called the peasant breed. Merino wool, for some people, think it's a much softer, much silkier kind of wool. That was the preference. And the king of Spain said, under penalty of death, you will not take these out of Spain. Well. There was a reason that we'll talk about later that they needed to take some sheep out. So he said, but you could have the churro sheep. We call them churro. That kind of got changed over as there were the frontiersmen came in. They just kind of changed the A to an O. And um, so when the explorers decided to go out, they took the sheep with them. Now, what I never knew 
prior to coming to the ranch was that sheep are dinner on a hoof. So those, those galleons that went across the Atlantic, not only did they have all the sailors, but they had a flock of sheep on, on board. So, you know, occasionally they did have fresh meat, mutton. When Cortez came, he brought sheep. When Coronado came up here, he had sheep with them. They just had sheep that came along with them because it was like a traveling supermarket. So the first time that they saw sheep was when the Spanish brought them up. Now, the, as I said, the indigenous people had been raising cotton. They learned about wool and they thought, you know, this is a great thing. Not only that, is it grows by itself on the back of the sheep. An interesting sidelight is that, well, the sheep are important to the Spanish. First of all, they were needed for the subsistence part of their living. And they also used them for trade to get that which they couldn't make. Very important to the Spanish. Navajos have a phrase that are called sheep is, li sheep is life. And that sort of says it all. It is an integral part of their culture. Um, along those lines, sort of an aside, in the 1930s, when we were dealing with the Depression and the Dust Bowl, yes, the Dust Bowl sort of came out of the overgrazing in the West. The US government's solution to that, we'll just get rid of all those grazing animals. They came in and wholesale slaughtered a third of the churro sheep here. Back to the Navajo saying, sheep is life. That wasn't gonna be okay with the sheep the Navajos, neither the sheep either. And so what they did is the Navajos took their flocks and headed for the hills, not where any of the white government officials are going. And they, the Navajos saved the breed. Had it not been for them, we would not have churro sheep. The churro sheep now, what I would love is to have a sheep standing here on a leash for you to see. Yeah, not, they're not crazy about leashes. So, but what I can tell you about them is they're a hardy breed. They um, have lambs easily and um, they will thrive in this kind of um, environment that we have here in Northern New Mexico. They have, now you count them, 1.6 lambs per ewe. So some have one, some have two, Occasionally, some have three, but mostly one or two. We have our lambs in the spring. We sort of jerry-rigged this system so that we have lambs in the spring. One, so it's a little bit warmer when they get born. And two, for Spanish colonial days, and when you all come out for, uh, we can only hope, Spanish spring festival next year, you can see sheep being sheared, and hopefully some lambs. They range from black, gray, brown, white, um, and some will have more than one color on them. And if you imagine putting all those fibers together, you get incredibly variegated yarn. Very nice. One of the important features about the churro sheep is that in this wool, there is very low levels of lanolin. Lanolin being the oil, so, you know, the oil in your hair? Well, the oil in sheep's hair is lanolin. Now, the reason that's important is you need eventually to wash this lanolin out of the, the wool because one, it will gum up your equipment, and two, you can't dye it with the oil on it. Think of oiling up a piece of spaghetti and then trying to get it to take sauce, not happening. So, um, we need to wash it. Low lanolin, not a lot of washing. New Mexico, not a lot of water. Those two go together really well. The other really fun thing about churro sheep is their horns. Now, both the girls and the boys have horns, and they can have no horns. Let's see if I can do this now. Two, four, or six horns. And some of those horns may go together. What's the word? Fuse. And so you may have somebody with five horns, or that's what it looks like. So 
the girls don't have as many horns or as big. Come see our boys, and they're awesome. Now, there are two things I'll talk about today that are ideal. One is that sheep are the ideal animal. And the reason I say that is, one, they have this unending, continually being produced wool on their backs. Don't have to do anything except feed them, but you turn them out in the pasture for that. So they can just, you get this wool year after year. Um, their meat is very tasty. And it is a fact of life in the ranch that, you know, animals do become dinner sometimes. And I have had churro sheep meat and it is good. The cheese that can be made out of the milk from the churro sheep, it is called manchego. I just bought some at a local market around here. It is really tasty. And of course, when the sheep comes to the end of its life, it still can be of use. The um, hide gets tanned and you have sheep's leather. The bones get made into needles, they get made into buttons. And what the hide tanners will eventually tell you through these presentations, but I just have to get this in, is that every animal on this earth has exactly the right amount of brains to tan that hide. So think of a sheep, big sheep. Think of the head, the brains, and that's exactly the amount of brains needed to tan that hide. I think nature is amazing. So we, um, so we have these sheep, and in the spring they need a haircut. So we call that shearing. We do it once a year. You can do it twice a year, but we don't need that much wool. And we like our sheep to have a nice coat for when the winter comes. Because let's face it, it does get cold around here. We have professional shearers that come in. They do it by hand. These are an old set of sheep shears. Sheep shears. Can you imagine making these work with your hands? I can't. Okay, if you can imagine making these work. Number two, imagine making these work and getting the fleece off all in one piece. Then imagine using these shears, getting the fleece off in one piece and doing it on a wiggly animal. I personally cannot imagine. Sean, our director of operations, he's quite good at it. After we have this large fleece, we put it on a big table, and then we have a skirting party. Party is my made up. But you'll get a bunch of weavers around, and they will skirt the fleece, meaning they will take out the, the hay, the, in our case, the alfalfa that's around here, and they will, um, and the poo that's in this fleece, and we'll take this out by hand before we go to actually um, wash it. I would pick up my wool here. After, so we have a fleece, now we have to wash it. Why do we wash it? For a couple reasons. To get a little bit more dirt out and to get the lanolin out because we talked about that. We, the oil just makes things more difficult. So the second miracle besides the churro sheep are yucca. So I'm going to talk a little bit about yucca, and then we're going to talk about how we wash wool. Now, the indigenous people knew about yucca and the fact that its root can make soap long before the Spanish got here. So it's an age old piece of knowledge that they had. And so they, um, yucca is just this, this amazing plant the whole thing can be used. The leaves, those spiny leaves, they can either be woven um, together or you can strip them and make threads out of them. You can make rope out of it. The stalk in the middle um, can be eaten. 
and the um, roots will can be used for both herbal remedies and soap. So, and everybody raise their hand that knows that the yucca is our state flower. Yay! It's very special in our state. So to wash wool with yucca, you send somebody out who's very strong, tuck this in, don't fly away, and you dig up some yucca root. And this is part of it, here's another part of it, and then you need to get the bark off. So you take a mono, ma mono, matate, and you pound the bark off. So you can see that I start stripping the bark off. The bark is not useful in this process. So I will proceed to get all this bark off and we'll end up with a piece that looks like this. So this has had the bark taken off of it and it's been soaking in my water. So you can see that it's really fibrous. Now I'm gonna take this piece and pound it some more and see if I can, if I, can you see the subs in, suds in that? So that's soap. Now, do I have great soap bubbles like we see in our sink when we do dishes? No, nature doesn't need to put a whole bunch of chemicals in their soap. Now, I will wager one of you has a relative someplace that says, oh yeah, my grandmother still washes her hair with yucca soap. The mildest soap on the world, in the world, I'll take this over Castile soap. And it also, in washing clothes, it, you're not gonna end up with the holes in your clothes like they did for the lye soap. Much more mild, much milder. So, a bunch of these are gonna go into a big kettle of water. And I'm gonna heat it up very gently. Then I'm gonna take my think, big fleece, but we only do this on a really small scale here at Golandrinas. Put it into the water and swish it around. Now, think washing machine. If I were to do that kind of motion with the fleece, what it does is felt. Felting is no good for us. That makes spinners very unhappy. So just gently swish it around. Think big fleece. People nowadays do this in bathtubs. It's not fun to lean over a bathtub to do this. And you get a clean fleece. Now, think of a sheep, think how big the fleece is, and um, think about doing this. This is not skilled labor. Kids probably would have been doing it and or helping. Everybody pitched in to do this because everybody needed the wool to then become yarn, then to become rugs or blankets to either sell or to use. Now, I have this will dry, and the next step is carding. Now you have to tune in to the next one because there is a master weaver spinner going to come in a, a little ways down the line and she's gonna show you how to card and how to spin. She's an incredible artist and you will learn so much from her. Questions? Wow, what a great presentation. Thank you so much, Patricia. Well, I hope you've all enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. Um, if you guys have any questions for Patricia about sheep, about weaving, go ahead and put those in the comments now and we'll take your questions. I have one, Patricia. I was wondering, you know, we're seeing an awful lot of wool here in front of us and these big, great sacks. So two questions. Are these sacks some of the creations of the Las Golondrinas weavers? Yes. What's amazing about these is this is called Hedega cloth, which is a very utilitarian cloth. Kind of think about burlap, only it's made out of wool and um, they wove beautiful bags. 
These are all natural colors out of the sheep. And this is what they would have packed the, the um, fleeces to send down to Mexico City. Wonderful. And, you know, I know we have probably, what would you say, 25 churro sheep here at Las Colondrinas. Do you have any idea of how many pounds or maybe how many, yeah, I guess how many pounds of fleece you get and that the weavers here at Las Colondrinas have to work with every season? You would get three to four pounds from a sheep. Um, on average and so if you had 25 sheep and three pounds per sheep it would be 75 pounds that we get wow so that's a lot of work it is i cannot <laughs> imagine the work you know here at las golondrinas we're just so lucky to have these wonderful weavers because truly it is so much work um they make it look so easy you know when you come out and visit on days that that uh if you've ever been to Las Colondrinas for one of our events, one of our festivals, um, the one thing you will always see are our Las Colondrinas weavers and they make it look so easy. But as you can see here, it involves quite the process. It takes many, many hours and many people to make these beautiful tapestries that we usually have all the way around the ranch. And we did have a question come in, I think because these shears, which are, you're right, pretty hard to imagine using. Do our blacksmiths make these shears for you? Our blacksmiths, our blacksmiths don't make these. These were gifted to the museum. It's potentially the blacksmiths could. One of the things about the weavers is they brought tools of that size with them. They would have brought maybe their, their shears. They would have brought cards with them. Um, pretty much everything else they built up here. Wow, all right. So definitely in, in New Mexico's history, it's something that a blacksmith would have provided for, for weavers. Gosh, any more questions out there for our weaver? See, you, can tr you covered it so thoroughly, <laughs> Patricia. Uh, so as Patricia told everybody, um, there will be other segments of Las Colondrinas live sessions where we're going to go a little bit more in depth into the, 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 the wonderful process of weaving here at Las Colondrinas, which starts with shearing our churro sheep and goes all the way to making tapestries like these herga bags here and blankets and sarapes and all sorts of things that, that people would have used that were really important in New Mexico's past. Um, so again, keep in mind, we are starting these Golondrinas live sessions. We'll be doing these about every couple of weeks, so make sure to check right back here on Facebook for details for the ones that are coming up. Um, any videos that we've done previously are all going to be on our Facebook page. Remember, we also do have a, um, an Instagram account at SF Golondrinas. If you haven't already subscribed to our newsletter, please do so to keep up to date with what's going on here at the ranch. Um, remember Remember that your adventure starts at golondrinas.org. And if any of you are wondering about my very fashionable face wear here, um, no, it is not the logo for Hunger Games. Although sometimes out here on a hot day, it's kind of like the Hunger Games trying to put on an event. Um, but these are our Las Colondrinas logo masks, and we will be putting these up for sale uh, pretty soon. So make sure to check back with us on our social media pages for any details. And of course, friends, if at any time you want to reach out, if you have any questions for us, um, our information is on our website, golondrinas.org. Again, thank you all so much for spending a little time with us on this Friday. Friday afternoon. Thank you for bearing with us on these uh, these beautiful afternoon New Mexico storms. And we can't wait to come to you again with another Golondrinas live session. In the meantime, stay well, be safe, and remember, your adventure starts at golondrinas.org.